So I'm looking at the schedule, and it says we we have Andre the Valiant on the show today. What, what's, oh, what's his deal? Your dyslexia is so bad, dude. It's Andre the Viant, like Andre the Giant. His last name's Viant. Oh, he's a wrestler. He's a bodybuilder and a personal trainer, competitive bodybuilder. So, like, what, he builds the bodies. Do you not know what a bodybuilder is? It's like Lego, right? Like, it it's it comes from the store and he puts it together. No, that's not how it goes. No. Well, it's like it's like my hip surgery, right? So like they had to they had to take the hip out, and then they shined it up and cleaned whatever they did with the thing, and then they shoved it back in. That's what he does. He he builds the bodies. You don't know what a bodybuilder is. I clearly do. Look, look. All right, let me break it down for you. Twenty minutes later, when I built my basement, the the wood came and the drywall came, and I hammered it all together. That's what he does, right? That's a bodybuilder. How are you not getting this? How am I not getting this? This is Andre's second story. The wrestler, right? Welcome to Second Story, everyone. My name's Corey Leckie. With me, as always, is Josh Sabalski. What's going on, Josh? Not much, buddy. Just uh, recovering from surgery. On the, I'm on the pain pills, and uh, we just painted the office, so I might be a little loopy for this one. Okay. Well, that would be different than normal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're looking... I was, I was going to say, like, you're looking a little frail and fragile. Is that because of the surgery? Well, yeah. I haven't exercised in, like, five weeks. So, oh, okay. Yeah. I also haven't had alcohol in five weeks, so that might be playing into it, too. I was at the start. I was just having a little bit of mouthwash just to fight the shakes off, but you know I'm good. I'm, I that ended. So, anyways, <laughs> all right. Well, fair enough. Um, our guest today is uh, someone who definitely knows about exercise. Is definitely not frail and fragile. Probably not drinking either. And yeah, prob- <laughs> probably not drinking at this point. Um. When he was younger, they they told him he was going to be a huge success, and he took that quite literally. So with us today, we have Andre Vaillant. How are you doing, Andre? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Second story, we're talking to people about pivotal changes in their lives, You know, maybe something that sent them from one path down a different path. Mm-hmm. Could be by chance, could be by choice. Yep. And uh, Andre, you've got a really cool story. So why don't you share it with us? Sure. Um, I guess the turning point was, you know, when I was in high school and I was uh, pretty overweight and um, yes, I didn't feel comfortable in my own shoes type of thing. So, um, you know, really it was like kind of like my dad was getting into shape because he was really out of shape and I kind of saw that and I was like, well, I think it's my time to give it a shot. And, you know, being a kid pretty much like 16 years old, working out did not seem appealing at all, but I, I, I enjoyed playing sports. So I, there was, you know, there was something that I enjoyed there, but, uh, you know, it was as funny as it is, it was a new year's resolution thing where I said, I'm going to do 30 minutes of cardio every day. And just that small little, you know, goal that I had to do that every single day turned into a big thing, you know, down the road because I didn't give up on it. And, uh, you know, that 30 minutes of cardio, is now a complete lifestyle change and, you know, is totally, a totally different. Per- I'm a totally different person than what I was back in, you know, when I was 16, 17 years old, uh, not working out and pretty out of shape. So, um, yeah, that was kind of the start of it. And it, uh, spiraled into what it is now, which is, like I said, far from where I was. I just want to clarify for the audience here that, um, you're a personal trainer, Yep. You're a competitive bodybuilder. Yes. Oh, yeah. Bit of a musician. Yeah, a little Is there bit. anything else that you got going on? Uh, <laughs> other than those things, I mean, those are my passions is bodybuilding, playing guitar, music. Um, like I said before, before we hopped on here, I went to school to be a carpenter, but kind of left that in the dust um, after a couple of years. Um, but yeah, so pretty much it started off. You know, after high school, I got into Muay Thai fighting, kickboxing. 
right? So that was my first real love for a sport, and I got into competitive fighting. And I fought for – I fought in the ring um, only three times, but they were, like, pretty solid fights. And uh, I didn't have any really uh, – I didn't really want to stop fighting, but I got a really bad knee infection at the time from carpentry. I was, uh, you know, kneeling down too much on concrete and the bone chipped off from the blood causing cellulitis. And I had had a major surgery and it, it put me out for a long time in terms of I couldn't hit with my leg without a lot of pain and all that kind of stuff. So then uh, during that, obviously during my kickboxing time, I started weight training, right? Because if you're going to be in a fight, you got to be able to be strong be your opponents and whatnot. So, you know, I was going to the gym every day, lifting weights. And, uh, when I couldn't fight anymore, I kind of really missed that drive that you get from competing in something. Right. You know, cause like I always played sports and, uh, when you leave high school, you know, there's really nothing else after that in terms of competitions, unless you really find something, you know, out, outside of those high school sports. So, um, my my friend, my 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 training partner, and you know one of my best friends at the time, uh, kind of dared me and bet me that I couldn't compete in bodybuilding, that it was too hard, and I couldn't do the dieting part because he was doing it, and it you know it is hard, it's insanely hard. But uh, I kind of took him up on that bet that I could, and he would coach me through it. So that was the start of it. So he coached me for my first bodybuilding competition, which isn't it wasn't bodybuilding; it's called men's physique, which is kind of like the smallest class out of all of them but anyways still the process is very similar so that was the start of the bodybuilding thing and uh yeah that was i think when i was 24 so okay. uh, yeah that was the start of it so my it was basically was an injury that led to a bet from a friend and you know here we are now kind of thing so i think eight i'll be coming up with my eighth competition now what was it specifically about bodybuilding that you fell in love with or like men's physique or whatever you want to call it? So it's funny. Like I really had no, um, no passion for competing in bodybuilding. I didn't really want to get on stage. I just, I love the training, right? The training for bodybuilding is really hardcore. And I think another thing that I really like about it is the discipline aspect of it all, but just be, because fighting and fighting, you have to be extremely disciplined. But bodybuilding, you didn't have to be more disciplined because not only is the training super important, but the diet is equally as important. If you're not 100% on with both of them, you're not going to get the result that you want, right? So it kind of tied everything in together. Um, and dieting, not that uh, not that it's never been like a – like I, I enjoy – I've always enjoyed dieting. But like the bodybuilding diet is an extreme, right? It's like over-the-top extreme. So – that was a whole new thing that I had to learn about. Is there anything with uh, bodybuilding that you don't enjoy? Yeah. Uh, the preparation <laughs> leading up to a competition, just the way you feel, the way you feel like your energy. Some days, it's, every day is different. But the majority of days when you get a really low percentage of body fat, you just don't feel great. Like, you know, you, you're basically your body's going into survival mode where it's like, feed me. I don't, I'm, you're, you're actually, you're exhausted, but you can't sleep because you're so hungry, you know, that kind of thing. And, and you get, you get moody, you get hangry, right? Way too easily. Luckily, I've, I've definitely learned how to control that as you, you know, the more often you compete, the more understanding you are of how you're going to feel and how to approach situations in life that come up. But, um, uh, that's definitely the worst thing about bodybuilding, I think is just the, final stages of prep where you're just dead yeah you know that's pretty much it other thing ever other than that i really i really don't uh i don't mind the the monotonous dieting of eating the same thing every day like i really like routine so that doesn't bother me and uh i i love eating too so eating six <laughs> seven meals a day doesn't phase me um yeah okay that's pretty much it. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Bad Workwear North America. They're a fashion-forward workwear brand from Australia with a wide selection of workwear for men and women that is not only durable, 
functional, but it is modern and stylish as well. With items like slim fit work pants, waterproof hoodies, as well as a robust women's line, you're sure to find something that you'll love. They offer free returns and exchanges on all orders, and listeners of this podcast can head on over to badnorthamerica.com, use the promo code Second Story at checkout to get 10% off their first order. Again, head on over to Bad North America. Go treat yourself to some new gear. When you were in, like, doing kickboxing Muay Thai, did you have to cut weight at all, or or were you having to get into weight classes, or was that you weren't in that type of competition? I always not no. I never had to make weight because I always sat right around my weight cap always, okay. which was uh, I fought around two hundred and twenty pounds roughly, so wow. I never really had to make weight for that. Corey, you, you kind of spilled into what my question was going to be. We had a UFC or ex-UFC fighter on in one of our first episodes. His name's Mark Holst. And oh, yeah. he was talking about how he, he kind of walked around at like 180, 185, and he fought at 155, right, Corey? Yeah. yeah he's and, and he talked about it, pretty much the exact thing that you just laid out as far as days leading up to a competition. It's exactly yeah. what he described as like the days leading up to a fight. It's, it's terrible. The cutting, yeah. is, the cutting is how you feel. And the cut is just it's terrible. Like, yeah. Can you compare it to anything like even remotely close to what somebody might go through in an everyday life situation? Uh, there is nothing, honestly, there's nothing I've ever experienced comparable. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing is like, I've, I've cut for, uh, I used to wrestle in high school too. So I had to cut for that. So, and which is the same as cutting for a fight, right? The difference from fighting cutting and bodybuilding cutting is that, the fighting cutting is rapid and it's just for literally to make weight. You don't care about your look, right? It's just to make a weight. For bodybuilding, yeah. you have to make a for my class at least, you have to make a weight cap, but you also have to look good, right? So if you rapidly lose weight, sometimes you're gonna sacrifice muscle, and that's the whole that's the, the total opposite idea of bodybuilding, right? So the, the bodybuilding diet is for a long period of time, it's four months of cutting. Versus two weeks possibly for a fighter, right? So not yeah. only are you extremely restricted restricted in your diet, but you're doing that for four months. So the long the long phase of it is extremely like just detrimental on so many levels to your your life and, and how you feel and the people around you and stuff. And it's also like it's a very selfish sport if you don't know how to control it properly, right? Right. So can you give us a, can you give us a glimpse into, so you said you eat about six, seven meals a day normally. Yep. You give us a glimpse into what sort of things you eat Mm -hmm. in that time. And then also what you would eat during a cut. Yeah, honestly. So from bulking to cutting, it's the exact same foods. So when I was, when I was bulking, let's say, you know, two months ago, uh, and to now, the foods are the exact same. The portions are changed, right? Okay. So I'll give you an example of what I'm eating now. So yeah. breakfast is uh, I'm doing uh, 200 grams of beef, so steak, 200 grams of steak, two eggs, and then uh, 70 grams of cream of rice, which is just rice. I used to eat oats, but it doesn't agree with me anymore, so now I'm eating cream of rice. So that's my first meal. My next meal is going to be – 225 grams of chicken or fish and 200 grams of rice. My third meal is going to be the same thing, but 250 grams of rice. I can also add 100 grams of vegetables in there too. My fourth meal is going to be my pre-workout meal, which I eat an hour to two hours before my workout. And that's 90 grams of cream rice, uh, two scoops of protein isolate, and uh, 15 grams of peanut butter, or almond butter. And um, then I work out two hours after that, after I eat that. And then after my workout, I wait about half an hour and I have my fifth meal, which is chicken and rice again, which is uh, 250 grams of rice and 225 grams of chicken. The chicken, um, the meat pretty much always stays at 225 grams. Um, other than that beef meal, a little bit lower, 200 grams. And then my last meal before I go to bed, maybe an hour before bed, I have Two scoops of protein powder, 20 grams of almond butter, peanut butter, and 100 grams of raspberries. <laughs> That's the day. I wow. eat that every day. 
So what's your so what's your total grams of protein intake and what's your total calories? Uh, currently, my total intake on protein, I believe, is 360 ca- uh, grams per day. And then uh, calories, I believe, on training days, I'm at 3,400 right now, which is wow. fairly low for myself. Like, it's getting low. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. So then normally when you're bulking, what? how many calories would you take in? Around 5,000. Yeah. 5,000. And like that, like this year, that was this year's bulk. The year before, I got up to just shy of 7,000 every day, and that was a grind. That was a grind. Yeah. <laughs> I was 7,000. Holy just shot, man. Yeah, shot of 7,000. Last, not this spot, but the last one. It's That's incredible. Corey and I have conversations all the time, like before I had surgery. Yeah. Um, and our conversation was always, did you hit 200 grams of protein today? That was always yeah. our number. And yeah. like, I would say for me, it was probably like four or five days a week where I would hit it. The weekends were always a struggle. I don't yeah. know what Corey's number was by the time we finished up, but. It was it was that. always a grind to hit 200 <laughs> grams. I don't know how you could possibly hit like 360. That's wild. If I was able, if I was allowed to, I'd I would want to eat 400 grams of protein or 500 grams. I just love it. I don't know. It's just I've always been a big eater. Wow. Always, yeah. <laughs> That's bonkers. Wow. Um, how how much do you sleep? So you mentioned you have usually uh, a meal like about an hour or two before you go to bed. How like how long do you sleep on average? I mean, I like to get eight hours on average. I just had a a baby, you know, me and my wife had a baby uh, six six and a half months ago. So sleep isn't what it used to be, but it's it's not terrible. Um, Most nights I can still get at least seven hours. Um, Wow. Sometimes broken, a little broken, you know, like, you know, baby wakes up crying, got to deal with it. Um, Yeah. um, Typically seven, eight hours, I can still try and get that in. Nice. But Congrats. ideally for bodybuilding, thank you. Ideally for bodybuilding, you want to be around like eight to nine hours. And uh, the more you sleep, the more muscle you're going to gain, the better recovery is, the more fat you're going to lose, all that kind of stuff. So sleep is extremely important for recovery and, and many different factors for bodybuilding and fitness in general. Yeah. Yeah, I got to fix that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, me too. I don't, I don't sleep enough. Yeah. yeah. No, and me neither. A lot of people, like even for like clients that uh, – or trying to lose weight, like one of the main questions is like, how was your sleep this week? Because if you get like five or six hours of sleep, like you get a lot to losing body fat, right? Like it's so it's, it doesn't get impossible, but it gets way harder. So right. even stuff like that, like for weight loss, like sleep is super important. Yeah. 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 Do you, um, so you do personal training. Do you have a gym that you go to or do you, um, like, current, like I have a, 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 a gym in my backyard here where clients come to. Okay. So, um, I've been training clients in there and, uh, it's, it's pretty big. It's about 1100 square feet. So, oh, wow. um, and I've got tons of equipment in there. So there's more than enough for everything to be done. And, uh, yeah, I train clients back, back in, in the garage. And then I train a lot of clients online here too. Not like where I'm like telling them what to do on video, but I make training programs, meal plans, uh, that come up with weekly check-ins. So I email them throughout the whole week, really, if they have questions and whatnot. But, uh, yeah, that's what I do full time. I've been doing personal training now in person for 11 years. Um, and then the online thing kind of started just before COVID. Okay. So, nice. Yeah. Time How do you find that? that? Like, do you, do you find that's a good, avenue to go i see a lot of people go into like the online coaching model yeah if you know what um it's it's good if you can if you can do it obviously like a, a, a social media is definitely going to be a huge make or break i think for a lot of the so like uh getting clients you know um a bigger following means a bigger you know place to promote yourself so um, that, and then obviously making sure that you provide content that is educational and kind of pulls people in to want to be trained by you. And then, um, just, I guess, being real with everybody too. Right. So, those yeah. Are things that, but yeah, I mean, you can get making a good living on online coaching or coaching in general, but, uh, it's all about putting yourself out there too. Yeah, people are craving authenticity. We talk about it a lot on this show, how oh, yeah. how much people are after authenticity. 
Yep. Which, yeah. I mean, you can see why. Oh, for sure. Um, I want to. I want to take it back a little bit to after your first competition that you had. So you mentioned it was a bet, and yeah. your buddy trained you. Yep. What was what was the thing that happened during that competition, or maybe after it, that got you to keep going with it? Um, the actual competition day, because before the day before the competition, I was sold that I will never do this again. <laughs> I'm never going to do this bodybuilding thing again. It was so hard. I'm like, screw this. It's not happening again. Then the day of the show, just being up there and just the. Uh, just the love for the sport with everybody that was there too. It's just like something that you have to be, you have to do it to fully understand. Um, but I immediately kind of fell in love with it that day. And then I remember getting off stage and I was like to my wife, I'm like, I got to start getting ready for the next one. You know, <laughs> no, it was, it was a total, it's crazy. But at the same time, um, you know, leading up to that show, like you're just so, you're so dead because you did so much work and, put every you know morsel of energy into that process so it's a lot yeah yeah what was it about being on stage was it like kind of an adrenaline rush for you was it the recognition mm-hmm. piece what what was it that you I, liked about i think that? it's just the it's not even it's not anything to be with actually being on stage i think it's just the feeling of being like you accomplish this this task and it's so big and you can look back and be like, I worked my ass off for this. And even if you don't win, like it's really not a thing about winning, but it's about being the best version of yourself. I mean, like a lot of people don't get me wrong. Majority of people, even myself, I obviously won't want to win, but right. you know, without the win, there's still such a big win personally for yourself. Cause every time you do a prep, I guarantee you're going to learn something totally new about yourself. And you're going to be able to handle life situations differently. Like you're going to be able to control your emotions differently because you know how hard things can get in life. Just from putting yourself through a prep is is kind of hard to under, like explain or like for other people to understand until you've actually done it. But you're basically making your life way harder for uh, a small reason, you know. And then when you finish, everything seems easy after that, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you say, or I'm sorry, how would you say that? Uh, your discipline. So you, you talked about discipline a few times. How would you say the discipline from bodybuilding has spilled over into other aspects of your life? Uh, yeah. Um, I think it me, it, uh, definitely makes you more like just, I guess, uh, hmm, dedicated to finishing a task, you know, like if you set your mind to a task, just get it done because, once you finish that task, it's gonna, like the reward and accomplishment feeling is going to be quite similar, right? But um, yeah. and and to never underestimate yourself and and what you can truly do. You know, never like tell yourself that you can't do it without, especially without trying. You know, and fully giving it everything you have. I'm somebody who's really trying to get a lot better with discipline. Corey too, him and I talk about it all the time, like just being better at being disciplined. Man, yeah. it's a hard it's one of the hardest personality traits to turn around in yourself. It's, it's really hard. Um yeah, and and really I think what it comes down to is like whatever those things are, just like, as simple as it is, write it down on a list. And if it's like three things, just check them off every day. Those three things, right? Eventually those three things will become easy. Like just like your everyday routine where you're less like, yeah, I do this. This is who I am. And then from there, maybe just add one or two more on, right? Once those yeah. things become like easy, it's like, you know, like hopping on this cardio machine behind me now in the morning, that's a, a no brainer. Like that's just like me breathing. Like I'm going to hop on there. I'm going to do 45 minutes of cardio. There's no if, ends or buts. It's going to happen, right? And like my meals, I'm going to eat six meals, 100%. There's no way I'm not going to have all six meals. Um, but for most people, those two things alone of the cardio and eating all the foods would be insanely hard, right? Yeah. It takes a long time to get that discipline, to get those things tapped in, right? The food for a majority of people is by far the hardest part, like dedicating your day to having set, even if it's five or four or five meals strict, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of being prepared and having your mind set to, uh, okay, I'm only eating these things. I'm not going to walk by the fridge and grab 
whatever's in there that's tempting you, right? So the discipline thing is definitely a hard thing to uh, grasp. But once, like I said, once you start checking those boxes, everything else is it gets slowly easier. Whatever Atomic habits. Do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But even there's yeah. things like myself that I got to still work on my, myself. And it's, it's, it's probably the little things that uh, most people already do that I'm just like passing on, like stepping over because my other ones are bigger in my eyes. But, you know. That's interesting. Yeah. Going on that around discipline for yourself and also for your clients, do you feel it's harder to, uh, I don't know, do those first steps like to lose weight or to gain muscle, whatever it may be, or is it harder to maintain a physique? I think maintaining is a lot easier if you were able to like, let's say you were obese and you lost the weight. That's definitely going to be the hardest part, right? Like changing those initial lifestyle habits. And that's what it is. It's changing your lifestyle habits. Nothing's going to be a quick and easy fix because if if it's quick and easy, you can quickly and easily go back the other way too. right? Right. So, it's, it's, it's dedicating yourself and learning a, a totally new lifestyle, whatever that may be. If you're something that's obese, like, you know, when I was younger, I was definitely obese. And, you know, those lifestyle changes were diet. And I had to learn, like, okay, I can't come home and eat literally a, bo- a bowl of ice cream, make a whole thing of nachos, and eat a box of craft dinner. Like, I would do that after school every day and then wait for my mom to come home and make dinner. And then I eat that and then have more ice cream after dinner and, like, yeah. You can't do those things. Right? You're not gonna. You're not gonna be in shape. So right. it's like understanding uh, the importance of nutrition. You know, maybe just educating yourself on that and uh, understanding why you can't eat or why you shouldn't eat a bowl of ice cream and nachos and all these things every single day. There's definitely room for them, but if you have a goal and you want to make that goal come to life, well, what's going to be the you know the things that you have to remove from your current lifestyle? get to the lifestyle that you want to live in you know yeah that's the that's the discipline right i actually have this quote written down that you remind me of i look at it every day it's do you want to feel the pain of discipline or the pain of regret yeah i always like if i eat something bad i always feel that regret i'm like oh "Oh, i shouldn't have eaten that thing yeah should have been more disciplined yeah sometimes even before you eat it you should think like how am i gonna feel how's this food gonna make me feel when Mm -hmm. i eat the food am i gonna be is it gonna be so satisfying that i'm I don't care. Like I enjoyed it. If so, maybe they have that food, but are you going to eat that food and be like, fuck, I shouldn't have eaten this butter tart or whatever it was, you know, like <laughs> we all know the butter tarts are going to be there whenever, whenever we want, right. We can always go to the store and buy them. It is there. But, uh, you know, sometimes yeah. also you got to think like, like sometimes I think like, did I earn it? Did I, is it something that I should have? Did I put in the work for this thing or whatever it is? But, you know, it all depends on, on your, your goal at the end of the day too and what you want to achieve. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that is the discipline, right? Oh yeah. Have you ever had like an injury or had to um, work through that? Yeah. Um, nothing insanely major. Like I said, like the knee surgery thing, like the, the uh, knee infection, that, that was an yeah. injury. That was an infection. Right. Um, I tore my oblique a couple years ago. That sucked. Uh, I was, I was I deadlifting. Yeah, I was deadlifting 700 pounds, and I just felt like a Velcro strap rip in my side. I was like, "Oh, like I didn't feel uh, good." And, uh, <laughs> it was just like a level one. It wasn't too severe because, thank God, I didn't try and pull through the lift. I felt it immediately and just dropped the bar. Okay, uh, but that sucked because it 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 definitely tore, and then my ribs actually went out of place from it because there was oh, wow. like, you know like basically they kind of tied in there, so my ribs went all. I, like this whole rib part of my rib cage was sticking like right out. <laughs> so that sucked. And uh, it's still, that still kind of haunts me every now and then I still feel it and yeah. uh, caused a lot of rib pain. My, my, my uh, left upper rib, I popped a, uh, I popped a rib out years ago, deadlifting again, and it's just never fully gone back in. So that kind of haunts me at times. So I, I try and go for massage and Cairo and osteo almost monthly to try and combat all these, you know, I mean, when you're beating your body up at the same time, you should be going for treatments on it, right? Like if you're putting in five hard, heavy workouts a week of weight training, you got to give it some uh, relief too and go for massage and whatever it is to kind of help recovery too. Yeah. But other than that, for injuries, nothing, nothing crazy, nothing like 
a torn ACL or MCL or spine's good, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. What about uh, some of your clients? Like, have have they had injuries and you've had to work around that? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, clients have come to me for injury uh, related things and, and rehabilitation and stuff like that too. Okay. Never, I've never really had a client injure themselves with me. You know, not in what. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've had like clients come for like ACL, MCL repair, uh, rehab training, and uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I've, I've had to work. I'm currently working on a client. He has a rotator cuff tear. You know, working on that. Um, okay. We're trying better certain things like that. But yeah, there's lots of things that you have to work around or try and help and get better. When, uh, so you mentioned obviously going to like Cairo and stuff like that. When you were like your friend helped you with your first bodybuilding competition, kind of trained you when you walked out of that and you kind of had that feeling of like, well, I'm this is something I'm going to do now. Was there like a team that you sort of built around you or did you have like experts that you consulted to assist you with actually getting into it full time, I guess? Um, so I mean, in terms of a team, like where I am, we, there's definitely a community of, of bodybuilders here that i um, pretty good friends with. And we all, you know, work off each other a lot. So we train with each other sometimes and not all the time, but like probably almost once a week, some of us, which is uh, good because not only do we help each other train, but we educate each other too and just work off each other. But yeah, myself, I, I do have a professional coach now. And, um, you know, pretty much after my first two competitions, that's when I reached out to a coach and hired them. And uh, I've had a couple co- like two coaches now uh, since I started competing uh, to help guide me through my own journeys too. Because every like it's really hard to do this whole bodybuilding thing without having a little bit of guidance or a coach, especially when you get into the dieting part and you're you are losing your mind because you're so hungry. Having somebody that holds you holds you accountable and guide you through the process is definitely an essential. Like I. All my uh, all my other friends that are bodybuilders too, they all have coaches, and we all even a, me as a coach, I have a coach, and my coach has a coach, like you know, yeah, for his bodybuilding too. So, yeah, yeah, I was thinking about that when I was talking to, to my friend Mark, who was the UFC fighter, and yeah. we, we just talked about like the basics of even getting to a fight, and he was mentioning like, oh, what a logistical nightmare to get like a spot where you can make sure you can work out before the fight, make sure you can get, yeah. get the proper nutrition after you do your weigh. And I was thinking about that for you. Like if you go to a competition, you still got to eat, you still got to, you know, sleep oh. somewhere, do all that stuff. And to handle that while you have the stress of the competition must yeah. really be something. It's a lot. The food part is definitely the hardest part because you got to have all your meals ready. And so now like, if you go to like, let's say you go to Toronto, like if you're in a hotel where you can cook your chicken and your rice, and all this stuff. Right. So, I mean, luckily there's Airbnbs now and stuff and you can rent an Airbnb. And just go. But yeah, when you touch down, you got to go grocery shop and get all your food, go back to the Airbnb, make it all, weigh it all out. Like there's a lot of steps in there. And then, yeah, try not be stressed about it. Get to your, the competition for the meet, meetings and the weigh-ins and the, there's a whole bunch of things that go into the whole bodybuilding uh, actual, you know, week of uh, competition that is pretty stressful for sure. Yeah. Yeah. What's the environment like at these competitions? Like, are people pretty cool? Like, is everyone like, yeah. hey, you're looking good, buddy? Or are they like, hey, f- hey, flabby arms? Like, are they? <laughs> <one's> like <that. laughs> There's definitely no tripping going on. It's all like very much uh, welcoming and supporting. And uh, okay. yeah, there's it's an awesome community of people. And uh, I think that's probably one of the other things that really made me stick around was just like, the love for the sport and everybody, you know, everybody that's there is work their ass off to be there. Like I said before, like whether you're, you know, the first guy or whatever, you know, like majority of you all worked equally as hard and went through the same kind of process. So you got to respect everybody there, you know, but everybody yeah. is looking around at each other being like, holy shit, this guy looks unreal. Like you're like, yeah, there's no <laughs> way I'm beating that or whatever, because you know, you don't look at yourself as being, probably the top guy there or whatever the situation is, but you're looking at it, everybody else being like, Oh my God, everybody looks crazy right now. You know, <laughs> have you had a competition where you got there and you're like, I'm not, re- I'm not prepared for this or I'm not oh, yeah. like, physically ready for it. Yeah. Every single time. 
Oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah. so, <laughs> that's very similar to fighting because that was something that Mark always said that he never felt prepared for a fight. Never. Yeah. Same. Well, I, I know how that feels too. Yeah. Yeah. What's is there a moment during the process where you kind of get peace with you're like, all right, I am actually okay. Yeah, I think once you're on stage, you kind of, well, at least for me, I was kind of just like, be like, this is it, like, I'm fine, just do your thing, and yeah, yeah, or just or just when other guys are being like, holy shit, like you look good, and then you're like, okay, I guess I'm okay, like, you know, get that that uh, reassurance. I was gonna ask you about your social media because I. I see like that it's grown quite a bit. Like you're, I think close to 200,000 on Instagram and somewhere like 500,000 on TikTok, I, I believe. Something yeah. Like, like that. 520. Yeah. 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 So what's, what's that been like for you growing that, that side of it? Um, I mean, it's been a journey. It's definitely taking a lot of work. Um, it started taking off. I think my, uh, last competition has started slowly climbing. Like, um, it, it started climbing when I, I started my TikTok. So I had like okay. 15,000 followers on Instagram for a while. And, uh, and then I started TikTok and, um, I posted one video on TikTok of my back walking up to the bar, which is really funny. Cause I had this video of me walking up to the bar for me doing, um, abdominal raises for my abs, which I thought was the impressive part. And my, and I, I'd clip out the part of me walking up to the bar. My friend's like, no, he's like, post the pitch, the video of you walking to the bar. Like, that's the crazy part. I'm like, I'm walking to a bar. What the hell is so crazy about that? I've seen this I video. The, I know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I posted that video. <laughs> and I remember posting it and, like, coming back to my phone, like, four hours later. And it had a million views. I was like, what the hell? I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And then that was when it started taking off. So I'm like, okay, like, basically, I just, whatever I post on TikTok, I just repost on my Instagram, right? And, yeah. uh. That was when it started to really take off. So I'm like, okay, like maybe this is my thing, my back training. Like I didn't even clue in that I had uh, a genetically like a better, uh, better back than I don't know most. I guess I don't know. Anyways, the back was a highlight. The back was definitely the highlight. And uh, sure. so I just started to kind of run with that and, and really pushing my back on social media and just putting out more of those walking up to the bar videos, which eventually, <laughs> yeah. It took off because then, like, uh, all the sports centers started reposting it. ESPN started reposting it. Wow. Uh, and that's when it took off. And I think within, like, I think it got to, like, 100,000 followers within, like, a year and a half after that post. And the, the TikTok grew, like, really rapidly, uh, which is funny because I put, like, I put such little effort into the TikTok side of it and really mostly on Instagram just because TikTok is not a good funnel for business, I find. Um, right. It's a good funnel to bring people to my Instagram, but it's not a great funnel because you can't really chat people up on it, on TikTok easily, right. and and majority of it is just bots and stuff like that. I don't know, like I don't love TikTok, um, so I'll post on there, but I don't actually spend time on it, especially because I just scroll through TikToks for way too long, so I just yeah. get off the app and then yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> my main focus in my business into my Instagram. So okay, yeah. yeah. TikTok is, I mean, it's, it is a real time sucker. That's for sure. I go on there sometimes to post some of our stuff and 20 minutes later, I'm like, why, why am I doing this? What am I doing oh, no. to myself here? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I'm really yeah. trying to, I'm trying to transition into uh, YouTube now. That's what I got to do because then I can actually start making money off of YouTube possibly if it all right. goes well. If I start growing on YouTube because um, as you guys know, you can't really make money on Instagram and TikTok in Canada, so they're not paying you, right? Compared to like yeah. the US. So Yeah, we're we're not making money on anything, but no. maybe one day on <laughs> maybe one day on YouTube. <laughs> we'll exactly. See, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um yeah, the social media thing is it that must be a, a weird feeling to have just to come back to your phone a few hours later and a million people have seen your stuff. Corey and I talk about it all the time. We're like, wow, nine hundred people watched our episode. Yeah. And if you if we're in an auditorium <laughs> with nine hundred people, that would be crazy. Yeah. Now you imagine a million people. That's just wild. Oh yeah. It is wild. It's definitely wild because sometimes I just know that like I'll create a video of my back now and I'll be like, this is the one. I'm like, this one's gonna hit like ten million. And like I remember like the last time I said that to my wife, I was like, I posted it right before I fell to sleep. I'm like, I'm gonna wake up tomorrow morning with like four million views on this. And sure enough, there was like four or five million overnight on this one video that I posted, which I think is my most popular one still. But 
It's uh, I would have a panic if I if one of our videos hit it. I'd be like, "What did we do? Like, what yeah. did we put in this video?" That yeah. Actually, it's circulating. Well, the first, first time, time I actually uh, posted one that went like stupidly viral, I was flying through Toronto, and uh, I posted it before going on the plane. And I so if you don't turn off the Instagram notifications and a video goes viral, and you're not on Wi-Fi, it'll use your data up like crazy, right? Oh no! Yeah. So oh, okay. my data literally like restarted that morning, and I got to Toronto, and I got a notification that my dad ran out, and I'm like, "What the hell's going on?" And then I realized a viral a video went viral, so it was just sucking my dad a notification like the notifications from Instagram, right? Like crazy. So <laughs> wow. and I yeah, and then I realized like like I had like hundreds of notifications from Instagram, and it was great. It, it, on my data so anyways yeah that's one thing that if you do go viral you have to make sure your notifications are turned off <laughs> yeah we're yeah. we're a ways away from that we've had a couple do some decent numbers but nothing close to what you're talking about hey, you never know we before you actually came on alex and i were talking about alex hermosi i'm not sure if you're familiar with him um he's kind yeah. of he's an he's a, he is an influencer yeah. yeah so one of the things he was talking about in this video i watched a couple days ago was he was saying that um, if you want to be exceptional at one thing, you got to give up pretty much everything else. Um, he said, sometimes you can be, yeah, he's like, sometimes yeah. you can be good at like really exceptional at two or three things, but you're going to have to really sacrifice so many other things. So I was thinking about that when I was thinking about interviewing you, I was like, I wonder like, what is it that you feel you've given up to, to pursue bodybuilding the way that you have? For sure. Um, I mean, sadly, I feel like, uh, certain like friendships in a way, your social life that uh, definitely takes a, a bit of a hit because you don't have time for it. Like, and you can't, like, you can't be going out to the bars and doing all that kind of stuff and hanging out. And, <clears throat> you know, like, it's nice because the people within that same group you can be friends with because you're going to see them at the gym. And that's kind of your hangout time almost, or you can go for meals and stuff. But, uh, you know, that, that traditional, like, going out on the weekends and staying up late and stuff, that's kind of gone. So that's probably the biggest hit, I feel like. Um, I mean, really the only other things that, I mean, maybe in my own life that have taken a hit that I put on a little bit less priority, but I still do, would be like even playing guitar. Like, I used to play guitar for hours a day, um, but I don't have that time anymore because I put those hours into bodybuilding and having a baby now, that also takes up a lot of time too. So I still get to play like half an hour maybe a day if i'm lucky or an hour sometimes on the weekends but that was you know one thing that i used to do all the time and uh like like religiously like hours a day practicing and learning new stuff but now you're just caught in that loop of just doing the same with the guitar but that's just very minuscule that's just like another hobby right but uh yeah i think the biggest thing is just uh your social life yeah 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 which is fair makes sense you know yeah yeah i I never really under, I've always been somebody who's kind of okay at everything. I've never been exceptional at anything. And the first time I was really ever introduced to somebody being really good at one thing and really bad at another thing was uh, Mika Zibanejad. He's a hockey player. I'm not okay. sure if you, you know, him. so no. he, he used to work out at the same gym as me. And I remember him coming in one time and he was playing basketball and he's like, he's tall. He's probably like six, four, six, five. And yep. I remember he was just awful at it. Oh, yeah. Watching a play, I'm like, this guy's a pro athlete. Like, how is he so bad at basketball? Yeah. But then, like an hour later, I I went worked out. I came back by the gym, and they were playing floor hockey, and he was just dangling everybody. I'm like, oh, oh yeah. right, yeah. he's so good at this that he doesn't have time to care about basketball. And That's right. That was a, oh, my first introduction to that. But I still haven't applied that to my own life. Maybe I should. Yeah. Never know. On your on your website, you talk about uh, progress over perfection. That's actually yeah. something that's come up a few times in in our episodes and um it's from james clear's atomic habits uh, yep. he talks about that quite a bit as well uh what is it about that particular expression that resonates with you i think it's almost like like you know how i was talking about being like in, in the bodybuilding competitions like you don't always have to be the number one person there but if you're the like that being the number one person is almost like perfection right but being the best version of yourself if you keep on coming up and showing up better than you, your last form that's at the end of the day, like what more can you do? Right. That's being, mm -hmm. that's being the best version of yourself. That's like checking all your boxes off and just being a better 1% or whatever it is better of yourself every time. Yeah. 
you know? I talked to my uh, 12 year old son about that a lot. He's a competitive swimmer okay. and you know, he gets bummed out sometimes when he doesn't, doesn't win or doesn't place or whatever. And I said to him, like, although you are racing against people, you're really racing against yourself. So just look at your previous times and did you improve? Yeah. Do you feel better? Like, are you gaining something out of it? And don't worry about what everyone else is doing. Eventually, if you're just beating yourself all the time, you're eventually going to beat them anyways. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So. Totally. Yeah. Do you have any inspirations or like heroes in the world of bodybuilding or, or anything like that? Um, I never really ever used to, but I definitely look up to like Chris Bumstead as, as a human being now, like he's just, uh, besides being a bodybuilder, he's, uh, very inspirational in terms of his lifestyle and who he is as a, a person, and his, his overall success and not only bodybuilding, but business too. Mm-hmm. You know, I think yeah. a lot of people would probably say that. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of piggybacking off of that where you mentioned YouTube and obviously you have your own business and stuff like that. Where do you want your journey to take you? Where would you like to go with all of this? Um, it's a good question. I mean, just basically doing exactly what I'm doing, but just growing it even more so, right? Just like eventually building a team with my online coaching and, um, yeah, just, really pushing the social media part of it, I think is probably the best route for myself and um, trying to just network a little more with the people in the industry. But uh, that's, I think, I think that's where I'm kind of going right now. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a question that Corey and I have been toying with for a couple of weeks now okay. is what, what do we want? Like, what do we want for our life? Where mm-hmm. do we want to go with it? And we really can't answer it. It's That's tough. I was curious if you had an answer. Yeah, it's like it's like your destination. It's where you want your life to end up. Yeah, and it's a really really hard thing. And you know, I don't know how old you are, but we're I'm in my 30s. Corey's in his 50s. We're trying to figure. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Corey. <laughs> Corey's in his Corey's in his late 40s, right? No, Early we're 40s, still, you bastard. <laughs> we're trying to figure out like what is that destination that that we're aiming towards, and you know. I've heard multiple people who are very successful say like, if you don't have a destination, it's really hard to make a map of where you're going. And right. I'm like, I don't know. And that's a really hard question to answer. It's tough. It is tough. Yeah. You, you have a much better answer than I do for it. And <laughs> much better than Corey's as well. Yeah. No offense, Corey. <laughs> Corey's was just like a that's question true. mark on the screen. He's like, I can't answer this freaking question. I was like, yeah. Me so I wrote on a, I wrote on a word doc. What exactly do I want? And it's just, <laughs> just a blank screen after. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people will just say like, well, I want to be wealthy or financially secure, but it's like, that's not a destination. That's just oh, it's not a kind fine. of, a, yeah, it's not a goal. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. It's just want, like, a, go ahead. It's like, you just want the prize from the, whatever the task is, but you haven't actually decided on what the task is going to be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a hell of a thing. A lot of people can't even decide how much money they would want. Like if you ask somebody that, how much yeah. money would be enough for you? A lot of people would be like, oh, 10, no, a hundred million. No, a billion. <laughs> just yeah. keep going up. Of course. Until they get to, yeah, of course. Right. Everybody wants to be super wealthy, but that's a real question that I'm still struggling with. And I've been struggling with it for a couple of weeks now. I've had a lot of free time just sitting around after surgery. I can't yeah. answer it, but I feel like I need to before I, I do certain things with my life. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. it. It's kind of a good thing to have, you know, written out. What is yeah. that real goal? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a tough one. Do you have any suggestions or um, anything to, to say to people about goal setting? Make them realistic. Don't do too much at once. You know? Okay. Just small goals. Uh, do it with consistency, right? Show up every day and do it. And uh, eventually, once that one goal is checked off, just move on to the next. That's good advice. Yeah, yeah, that is that is great advice. I don't think too many people do that. Everyone, New Year's New Year's Day, the resolution. Yeah. I'm not going to eat chips every night. I'm going to quit smoking. I'm going to quit <laughs> exactly. drinking Pepsi. I'm going to quit like five different things. Just just yeah. do one. Just do one and just do it <laughs> yeah. and actually do it. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's the discipline, that's, right? That's exactly it. Yeah. If you were to look back on your life, is there any advice you would give your younger self? 
I've been asked this question before and I had an answer. Now I can't think of it. Think back to that chubby, chubby kid back in high school. What would you say to him? Yeah. Eating nachos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Quit eating that nachos. Was me too. Yeah, yeah, that was me too. <laughs> I don't think I really have many regrets in terms or like not regrets, but like things that I would, I guess maybe if it was, if I were really want to speed up my process, just being more educated in terms of, you know, how to get in shape, but that's all part of the journey, right? Like, I think majority of people, when they come to uh, the whole getting in shape thing, if you're out of shape, is you don't know what to do, but by trial and error, you learn what to do, right? So I don't, yeah, I don't think there really be that much in terms of uh, what I've what I've accomplished so far. Okay. Yeah. Does it does it bother you at all? Like the so obviously the world we live in, profit is sort of like the big thing for companies. There's a lot of marketing that goes towards kids and teenagers and stuff like that for unhealthy food. I don't think I'm shocking anybody oh, yeah. by saying no. that. Does that bug you at all when you see stuff like that, that there's not really a lot of good education for kids when it comes to food and you know nutrition, diet, exercise, all that stuff? I mean, it is definitely shocking and it's like, it's kind of sad, you know, but obviously these, these companies are making, bil- not millions, but some of them billions and that's what they do, but uh, it's kind of sad that so many people are just not necessarily. I guess it is brainwashed to thinking that that's okay, right? Mm-hmm. That these things that are just are clearly not healthy for us, not whole healthy foods, are okay to have every day in mass quantities, and uh, I think that's where it kind of starts to hurt people. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah, that's something you, you'll really recognize it. Like being a parent, oh, yeah. you'll start to see, oh my gosh, it's everywhere. Like it's oh, just, yeah. your kids are blasted with it nonstop. I really, my wife and I have really tried over the last couple of years to be a, a model of good health for our kids. Good. You know, I, I feel like if, if they see me drinking Coke, they'll be like, why, why are you having that? And I'm not like, I want yeah. that too. So, True. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a hard thing to constantly do in front of your kids. Try to try to always eat, you know good foods like you said whole food stuff like that but yeah i think it's really important and yeah i hope it's something that we change as a society very soon yeah it's definitely something that needs to be having a light shined on for sure if people come to watch this podcast with you on it what would they take from it i guess um maybe just from my my journey uh that you could change your life around if you really want to and you could do whatever you want as long as you like i said stay consistent with it and just don't give up on yourself. Right. Cause that's basically what I, I didn't do was give up I didn't just stop because I didn't want to, or because I didn't think it was possible. I didn't, I definitely didn't think I would get to where I am right now. That's for sure. But you know, from where I started, um, but yeah, just don't give up on your, your goals and your, your, your dreams of what you want to accomplish. Awesome. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, awesome. Do you have anything uh, you want to plug? Um, if you are looking for coaching, you can um, either go to my Instagram, which is uh, Andre the Viant, um, and there's a link in there, or you can just send me a DM. But there's also a link to all my online coaching programs, uh, video call, like if you want to come on onto a Zoom call with me, book a Zoom call, and uh, yeah, it's all right there. So if anybody's looking for a coach. I got uh, room still, whatever, whatever the goal is, weight loss, muscle gain, strength gain, do it all. I should note too, that, um, Josh thought that it was Andre the valiant because he's dyslexic, but I had to correct him that it's Andre the Viant, like Andre the giant. I knew that, but yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I actually re- I actually did know it was Andre the giant cause I read it on his website three yeah. times yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It did say that there, there you go i actually i actually went to your website did some research for this Corey. i don't know i don't know what you did <laughs> what do you even do on this show <laughs> producer sometimes ask no. questions yeah, sometimes <laughs> yeah all right well all right thanks all right, again, Andre, Andre. it was awesome yeah, i appreciate, appreciate it. it thanks for having me it's good talking to you guys you too uh if anyone is out there listening to this on Spotify or any of those listening platforms, you can also uh, go see the visual version on YouTube and vice versa. If you're watching this on YouTube, please check us out on Spotify and all those other listening platforms. Thanks for checking out Second Story. <laughs>